This cup was actually broken years ago, the very same first weekend that I originally bought it at a medieval type fair. Despite the cracks, or maybe because of them, this is my absolute favorite cup. It's a historical design with very pretty colors, slightly floral, slightly geometric, clearly handmade. And I think that there's something about it being ruined right away. It meant that it was no longer pristine, no longer something that I felt like I had to be super careful around, which means that I've taken it with me everywhere. I had been camping a bunch over the years. I use it for coffee around the house. It's just kind of my casual everywhere mug. Because it's already broken, I don't really have to worry about it. And as a kind of a quick aside, I've actually kind of developed a little bit of a similar philosophy when it comes to sewing, especially for reenactment. When you spend a ton of time into creating something, I've found it's really easy to fall into this trap of not actually wanting to make the fullest use of it because you're tiptoeing around trying to keep it as neat and pristine as possible. I once even made a really like rough linen apron for making coffee and breakfast in the morning, knowing that it was specifically something that was supposed to get dirty and messed up. And I still initially found myself really trying to not mess up my brand new apron. My partner noticed me in camp once with like messy hands looking for a towel or something to clean off my hands. And he says like, isn't, isn't that exactly what you made that for? He's right. <laughs> uh, it was made to be used and I've started to try and apply that thought process to all of my things. I don't want to hinder the fullness of my life because I'm trying to take the careful path. Ceramic cups are made to be used and possibly chipped. Dresses are made to be worn and hems are made to be muddied and aprons are supposed to get dirty. I packed up just about all of my dishes at this point, but I left out this sweet little broken one because I think he's got all the right vibes for a hectic move and therefore gets to hang out while I do the rest of the packing. Speaking of which, we are packing up because we are moving. And as I've been getting ready to go, uh, I've decided as a sort of going away present to myself, I would ask the lovely artisans who originally made this cup if they would be willing and able to make another one for me. Someday, little Chippy here is likely to break completely and I kind of want a new friend uh, waiting in the wings to get pulled into action. The artists were totally down to make another one for me and even said that I could come up to their studio to see some of it being made in person. It is a little bit of a drive, so before I head out, I'm gonna go ahead and get a big pot of coffee going thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Trade Coffee. With Trade, you can discover great new coffees from some of the best roasters around. They'll help you find the perfect coffee and deliver it right to your door. First, you'll answer questions about how you like your coffee and Trade will help curate matches for you based on your answers. Then you choose your delivery frequency and it'll just appear at your doorstep easy as that delivered fresh from the roaster. Lastly, you'll rate your matches after you've had a chance to try them so that Trade can continue to give you just the right coffee that you'll enjoy. I love that they have tons of roasters from all over the country so I can explore distant small businesses or I can even support a local roaster from here in Seattle. Cafe Vita is fantastic and it's just awesome to have them delivered right to me. All of the coffee that I've ever gotten through Trade has had super recent roasting dates which means that you're getting the very freshest product. That's actually a huge part of their goal. The coffee is roasted and shipped within 24 hours of ordering. I also really love that they use compostable packaging to ship all their coffee in. You lovely companions can get 50% off of your first bag of trade coffee by using the code MORGAND50. Picture me plus a giant D50 and then go over to drinktrade.com. Trade guarantees that you'll love your first coffee, but if you don't, they will ship you out a different bag for free. Now that I am all coffeeed up, let's head out. So while I'm driving, a quick bit of background. Pottery is one of the oldest human inventions with pottery vessels appearing during the Neolithic period in cultures all over the world. 
the skill and knowledge needed to create pottery seems to have sort of independently developed pretty much anywhere that they had clay. Discovery may have happened accidentally by sort of creating it at the bottom of fires in a really clay-rich soil. Clay vessels were used throughout history for holding liquid and food, for cooking, for storage of all sorts, and pottery was not only incredibly useful for functional needs, but could also be really quite beautiful, providing evidence of decorative motifs and insights into the lives of ancient people that could then survive for thousands of years. We can even learn a little bit about their clothing production, because some vessels were decorated with fabric by impressing a woven bit of material into moist clay. This makes it possible for us to study some of the ancient weaving techniques even though the cloth itself has long since not survived. I am now at the workshop of Running Teen, a small family business specializing in handmade, historically inspired functional pottery since 2004. Clay-based pottery can be roughly divided into three main groups. You have the terracotta, you have the stoneware, and you have the porcelain. How vitreous the clay is, how high fired it is. This is how you test it. You weigh the piece and then you put it in water, and boil it for an hour, take it out. How much heavier is it? How much weight did it gain? Terracotta is like the clay pot you get from the hardware store. Yeah. You have the stoneware, which will hold water. And for porcelain, it's less than 4%. The black clay we use is 1%. It works really well throwing it with the porcelain. It's an interesting clay. Sarah and Elizabeth work primarily with stoneware and porcelain, depending on the intended use for the final project and the style of historical excellent piece that they're trying to recreate. They cover a wide range of time periods. The earliest time period I think is Bronze Age. We've been asked to do Bronze Age, which is fun. Are there a lot of excellent pieces still around to reference? Yeah, there are. They've okay. been finding little bits and pieces. They've done enough to extrapolate what they look like. And they have a lot of the museum pieces that they were bringing out to show. And they could tell the different age from the clay structure, the fabric of the clay. While they are heavily inspired by historical pottery, there are some key differences between how they work today in the 21st century versus how their reference pieces would have been created. For example, in order to increase the longevity, durability, and food safety of their pieces, all items intended to be used with food and drink are glazed on the interior surface. Historically, older pottery was not glazed for quite a long time, which absolutely has its drawbacks. Cook pots weren't made to last. They would only last a couple weeks because they weren't glazed and they were porous. Stuff gets in there, the bacteria, mold will grow. And that's gonna be hard to clean out. Didn't matter, they toss it out, get a new one. They might've been shiny outside, if anything. It was just decoration. It wasn't until 13, 1400s that you started seeing pottery glazed on both inside and outside. And well, they started lasting longer, oddly enough. In addition to using more glazes and lead-free food safe ones at that, they also diverge from period practice by using a modern kiln. Historically, there are several styles of kilns used all over the centuries. Well, you have the coal fire, the wood, you have the clamp kilns where they pile the burnable materials in with the pottery. It's one of the earliest varieties of kiln. Then you have the bottle kilns, they're huge. They're like a couple of stories tall. You have the outer building, then you have the inner building, and they're big enough to walk into, and you stack everything in, and those were coal-fired. Really bad for the environment. Every piece of pottery made both in history and now must go through several steps from start to finish. First, each new piece has its raw clay measured out for consistency, then it's thrown on the wheel. So here's where the main shaping will take place. Whether it's going to become a cup, a bowl, a plate, that happens here. Historically, these would have been turned using the potter's foot or hand, manually spinning the wheel themselves, but modernly we can take advantage of electric powered wheels. If making a mug, you have to wait about a day to attach the handle, and once attached, you then have to wait for that to dry fully, which can take about two weeks on average, less if it's in the summer, a little bit more in the winter. Then you load the kiln and complete the first firing, called a bisque fire. All of the pieces have not had any glazes applied yet, it's just the plain clay. This is where pottery goes from mud to stone. 
After about a day, the kiln has cooled down enough that the bisque fired pieces can be removed and decorated. First, a pencil guide will be drawn to get the design placed. The pencil marks will completely burn away in the kiln, so these are just for reference while applying the gazes. Next, the kiln will be loaded up again for the second firing, and the glaze on the pieces will melt and essentially become glass. For this reason, it is very important that the pieces do not touch one another at all, since you're, you're literally breaking glass in order to separate them again. For pieces glazed all over, they have a special spiked implement like this to keep them from touching the surface of the kiln bricks. Now that we have the basics of pottery in general down, let's move on to the reason that I came here today. We do historically inspired pottery. Historically inspired pottery for modern usability. It is because of their awesome specialization in historical design that I originally purchased this cup from them in 2012 and why I'm back today. This particular design is based on a 16th century pitcher or jug, but they do have so many more from lots of different times and places. The goal isn't always to make a direct replica, but sometimes just to take little parts and pieces of decorative elements. They have everything from the earlier Greek pieces. Both the black and the red were actually the same clay, just refined differently. And it was a really complicated like four-stage firing process where they fired it to a certain temperature, which would turn part of it black, but then they had to cool it back down to keep the red part from turning black. It was complicated firing. The Iron Age stuff in the Hall of Roman, which was fairly concurrent, in the case of the British Isles, you saw the Iron Age stuff go away once you had the Romans come in. So there's times and places where they were mixed. This piece here is a mortaria, basically a way of grinding food. This is what the Romans used to make pesto. But you did see the animal-headed drinking horns well before and well after the Greek booze. The Greek were just really famous for it because he had like the Etruscan and even some of the early uh, like Mesopotamian. They had not only animal heads, but they'd occasionally have like feet. They were called stirrup cups because they'd be handed up to the people on horseback, which is the reason why they didn't have to be possible to set them down because they were decorative things and they'd frequently be made out of like silver and things of that nature. Some of the uh, Greek stuff that you see that is white and black, those didn't actually start off white and black, but all the other painting was ephemeral because the white base coat, that was fired in place, but there was actually lots of painting over that, in some cases gilding. It was polychrome wear, but we can't see that now. They went into a lot of the bright turquoise glazes, just not one of the easier colors to achieve in a food safe format, because they used toxic levels of copper to achieve that color. And there's the Italian stuff that's more into the early 1400s. They start making heavy use of blue. And they were using a white wash over a stonework clay because they didn't have the white clay that they highly prized that was coming out of the other end of the Silk Road. Mid 1400s, start getting lots of bright colors on the Italian wares. And you have the different color combinations and different painting styles from different regions. It was actually a common thing to take pieces that were made out of another media and replicate them in clay. This was originally a leather flask, but you also saw a lot of like bronze and silver pieces that were being replicated in clay. They were you know, more affordable. They were basically some of the original knockoff wear. 1700s, you'll see things called agate wear, which are similar to the black and white wear, but they were more heavily swirled. They'd actually wedged the two clays together. I loved getting to hear about these works as well as many more at their shop, but it is about time to go. It was so much fun to see another artist's workspace. Because we work in vastly different materials, there is so much about their space that is just not the same as mine, but the bones of how one works in a creative space felt very similar, and I, I just loved it. Thanks to the lovely artists for inviting me into their space. It was an absolute treat. My new cup is going to need a few more weeks to get through all of its stages, but I will make sure to post a picture on Instagram next to the experienced older sibling so that you guys can see them both side by side. Check out the description for a link to that as well as links to Renning Teen. They actually have a YouTube channel where they do live streams of throwing pots or unloading the kiln. It's very, very cool. Check it out. 
Lastly, a big thanks to Trade Coffee for sponsoring this video. Make sure to check out their link below for delicious coffee.